بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome everyone to another Project Yahya podcast We're now approaching the tail end of the Islamic month of Ramadan which as we all know follows the lunar calendar and it's usually around this time uh, or around the beginning or the end of the month of Ramadan when we run into controversies regarding who sighted the moon and who we can trust about uh, seeing the moon. So we thought it would be uh, interesting to bring on somebody who is an expert on sighting the moon and looking uh, and you know navigating and keeping track of time using the moon and the stars and somebody who's been doing it their whole life. Uh, and this is sort of a lost art um that doesn't exist really around you know it uh, doesn't really exist especially uh, ever since um the production of you know modern gadgets that we used to keep track of time and things but uh, our ancestors and especially in muslim uh, societies this was something that was um important because that's how we uh, kept track of track of our islamic calendar using the moon so for this, we have brought on somebody, as I mentioned, who is um, somewhat of an expert uh, on this. We have with us uh, our special guest, Mr. Uh, Bruce McClure. Um, uh, Mr. McClure, welcome to the Project of Hia podcast. Well, thank you. I'm uh, pleased to be on. Thank you. And hope I can answer your questions. Well, <laughs> I'll try. You'll do a much better job than how, you know, uh, <laughs> anything. You, you know more about this than anyone else we know. So, so just a little background on our uh, guest today. In 1979, uh, he hiked the Appalachian Trail. And uh, really, he's done a lot of hiking. Um, he told us about how he hiked the, um, you know, the Rockies as well and so many other places. But uh, during the, that hike, he noted how our ancestors used the sun, moon, and stars for celestial navigation and timekeeping. And soon thereafter, our guest, he started to make sundials and star dials and started keeping track of time using the moon and stars. And in 1998, he earned his certificate in celestial navigation. Uh, our guest, Mr. McClure, has written uh, articles for stargazing as well as astronomy and sky and telescope uh, astro for astronomy and sky and telescope magazines, mm -hmm. uh, and also was one of the lead columnists from 2004 to 2021 for Earth Sky for the Earth Sky website. Uh, he's also done shows at the Potsdam uh, New York Planetarium as well as, as as well as Clarkson University Observatory. So inshallah, we're going to engage with our guest on, um, I guess, questions surrounding moon sighting, which is important to us for religious reasons. But I think it's important for I, people just to know how to, um, you know, or get a handle of this uh, lost art. Once again, uh, it's important and there's value in it. So with that, I'll uh, ask uh, Musab, uh, if he has anything to add before we jump into the questions. Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Molana Asad, for that intro uh, for our guest. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome. And actually how um, I came across Mr. McClure is I was searching up some articles on, uh, you know, how the, uh, on the new moon and, and, and so on and so forth. And I came across an article on earthsky.org. And uh, then, uh, you know, Mr. McClure was actually the author for that article. And then when I saw how many articles he had written, so I, I, I click on his name, the author name, and then I see like there's 10 articles. I'm like, that's a lot. And then I'm like, okay, let me see how many pages there are. And there's 95 pages and each of them have 10 articles. So he's, I think th there were like more than 900 articles just on earthsky.org on, you know, somewhere on this topic. So um you yeah know, that's you know, what i meant by he has a you have a lot more to say on this than uh <laughs> yeah and they were very much in uh in detail so you know thank you for that i definitely benefited from your articles and um thank you, you. Know, yeah so thank you very much and we're very happy to have you and uh i guess we can just start off by um uh ha you know uh Letting you letting you speak to uh, speak to this uh, you know to what actually inspired you to 
you know go in, go down this path? Well, I always loved being underneath the stars. Even as a little kid, I'd beg my parents just to let me sleep outside. Hmm. And so they became my friends. The constellations became my friends. Uh, and I would watch shooting stars. I would know the change of position of the stars throughout the night and saw how that was used as a, how the stars serve as a clock and that the sun serves as a clock and the moon serves as a clock. Uh, wow. One of my favorite things, though, is to watch for a young crescent. I love watching the sunset. And then watching day turn into night, I think twilight is the most beautiful time of day. And I think it's the biggest thrill in the world to see that tiny, tiny crescent moon for the first time. It's like this rebirth. Uh, and then I've learned a lot, like when you can see a young moon and when you're not likely to. Would you like me to elaborate on that shortly? I won't go into a whole lot of detail. Sure, yeah. we can add. We can have a question uh, specifically for that. I think that'll be very relevant as we get into the other questions. Um, okay. But we will come back to that point for sure. Cool. So, um, uh, how did you, uh, you know? Uh, like you mentioned, uh, what what inspired you when you were when you were younger? Um, would you just were you mostly just uh, interested um, uh, uh, like in the moon, or were there? Did you used to look at other for other planets, other galaxies as well? Um, and how did you kind of uh, educate yourself on this topic? Um, well, I would consult people, and I live in a. I guess I've lived in university towns and knew professors so I could freely talk to people. And, and of course, as the uh, web developed and you could uh, get a hold of people, I could expand my knowledge that way. Most of it's from outdoors and being outdoors, going to star parties and meeting people who sh share the same passion. Wow. So there's a, like, a, you were part of like some groups and clubs that were in, just also interested in, uh, in stargazing and. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then at the observatory, we would have public, it would be open to the public on Fridays and weekends, mm. depending on how clear it was, but, and sure you would talk to people, exchange notes and uh, it just helps when you associate yourself with people that share yeah. your passion. Of course. Uh, it was mainly naked eye to begin with. So uh, even though there are a few galaxies you can see, believe it or not, with the naked eye. Hmm. Wow. Like the Andromeda galaxy. But yeah. it's still very faint. It's still very dim and you need a dark sky. But you can see it even without binoculars or a telescope. Um, yeah, I still remember when I was uh, younger, um, I, you know, we used to visit family in Pakistan. That's where my family's originally from. And because there's not a lot of light pollution, mm -hmm. uh, we were kind of out there. And I would just be astounded by how much you could actually see in the sky. Because when you live in, over here, we were living in uh, Atlanta. We're kind of living in Midtown. Mm -hmm. at that time. And you couldn't hardly see anything. And really, even in the other towns. Uh, outside nowadays with so much uh, you know light it's hard to see you know what the sky actually has in it what's actually hidden in the sky but when we used to go out there and you know there was just nothing but the open sky and it was you know unbelievable and you could actually see you know you would see shooting stars and it was just kind of over mm -hmm. and I, I can actually relate to the feeling of you know the grandeur of what I'm what, what you know what I'm seeing and how amazing and how deep it is yeah, and we're losing that. Yeah, through light pollution. Yeah, that would be a shame, right? But now we have dark sky sanctuaries that really? are being put up in various places to help save the night sky. Because how do you explain that to anybody, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Wow. 
Well, so I'm going to ask a, a series of questions, and I'm going to try to build on top of um, the last one. So, uh, first of all, let's let's go into uh, moon sighting, like you already alluded to. Um, how can uh, why why does the moon have phases? Okay, the the moon orbits Earth, go circles Earth in about twenty nine and a half days. So when the moon is between Earth and the sun, it's new moon, you can't see it generally because the lit side of the moon is facing the sun, the dark side of the moon is facing us. And even if it, there is a tiny crescent, you're not likely to see it because it's gonna be lost in the glare of the sun. And then as the moon makes its trip around the sun, You'll have the first quarter moon. They call it first quarter, even though it's half illuminated. Mm -hmm. And then as you keep circling, when the moon is on the opposite side of Earth from the sun, it's a full moon. And then after that, the moon is said to wane. And then you have last quarter. Again, it's half illuminated, but it's called last quarter. The reason it's called quarter is because at that point, it's three quarters of the way around in its journey. Hmm. And then finally, it loops back and you have new moon again. So does that seem yeah. understandable? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, when the moon goes around the, uh, around the earth, um, how come we don't have a uh, solar eclipse every single month, right? Instead of like when uh, when the new moon is there, when uh, when when the earth, when the the moon is between the Earth and the Sun, how come we don't have an eclipse every single month? Great question. Okay, if the moon went around the Earth on the same plane mm. that the Earth goes around the Sun, we would indeed have an eclipse a solar eclipse at every new moon and a lunar eclipse at every full moon. But mm. the moon's orbital plane is inclined to Earth's orbital plane by five degrees. So mm. like we're going to have an eclipse on April 8th. Sure. Okay. Be before that, the uh, moon went we'll say below the sun, or it'd be more accurate to say under uh, south of the sun. Okay, mm. we're going to have an eclipse on the 8th. And then on May, May 8th, probably, then the moon's going to be too far north or above the sun to eclipse it. Mm -hmm. So the moon, the moon crosses the Earth's orbitable plane twice a month hmm. and that's called at the node so a new moon or a full moon has to closely align with the node for an eclipse to take place hmm. so what you're saying is on most months um you can say that uh the the moon when it when it's between like you know when there's a full moon it's not directly between uh it's not on the uh, you know the line between the earth and the sun it's slightly above or slightly below because of which the the rays of light you know uh, uh hit the earth and the moon both um and and that's why we don't get uh we don't have the moon blocking uh the the sun's light to the earth yes cool. you got it right yeah. Cool. And uh, for, you know, for the months, um, you know, uh, for the, uh, the normal month when we have a new moon, um, why is it uh, not possible to see the new moon? Uh, you know, this is it just because of the glare of the sun? Is it at all possible to see the new moon? Is, can, can a person see the new moon through uh, telescopes or uh, technology? Uh, yeah, well, there, there's actually photos of the new moon. I mean, if, if you do a search, you can probably come across one. So, yeah, you can, like with a camera, catch the new moon. Uh, I think it'd be really hard to do it with just the eye alone for two reasons. 
first of all, the glare of the sun, that's going to be dangerous. But the glare of the sun itself is going to make it so you can't really see it. Um, hmm. So I think the new moon is just too lost in the glare of the sun. And the crescent, if there is one, is so small that you're not likely to see it anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the uh, uh, let me ask another question before. What is conjunction? And is that different than the new moon? And And actually... Uh, you know, sometimes we hear new moon um, being used in two different ways. Like it seems like astronomically you'll have an astronomical new moon and then uh, colloqu colloquially people use it to mean the youngest crescent. Is that an accurate distinction or is there more to it? Um, I'd say that's accurate. Like um, I think historically new moon meant when you could first see it. So you would first see it just right after sunset real close to the western horizon yeah so historically that would be a new moon because that's the first time you were aware or actually visually mm. saw it uh, now that you can calculate it um and so i think there's two definitions of new moon sure uh and new moon being meaning conjunction like it would yep. be in conjunction with the sun uh correct well, so that means the, the, the moon, when it makes its full orbit around the earth, and when it finally comes in line with, uh, with the sun and it disappears, that's what we would call an astronomical new moon or conjunction, right? Correct. And then, and then when it travels enough out of the glare of the sun to be finally visible, um, that's what we would call astronomically the youngest crescent or colloquially or historically uh, the new moon, when you're finally able to see a sliver of the uh, I think it's the waning crescent, right? Or, or sorry, the waxing crescent, if I'm not wrong. In the evening, yes, correct. In the evening, okay. Awesome. And um, how did those, like you mentioned, there are photos of the new moon. Uh, are those like perfectly at conjunction? And how are they achieved? Like, uh, how is it possible to get those well, photos? The, the one that I saw, okay, the moon can be anywhere from five degrees north of the sun to five degrees south of the sun. In this particular photo, the moon was five degrees, I think north, but it was about five degrees away from the sun. So that's the farthest a new moon can be away from the sun. So that's probably why they took the photo at that point. And five degrees would be the equivalent of like 10 moon diameters. Uh, so that was probably the best opportunity to actually catch a new moon with the camera. Mm. That makes sense. If, they, if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say, like it, it's about as far as a new moon can be north. In this case, I think it was north, but away from the sun at conjunction. Here we're talking about a specialized camera, right? Or is it? I think so. It's nothing that I've done or I'm familiar yeah. with. I just, seen the photo that i'm sure if you just do a search you would find it. yeah no i was just curious because a lot of you know we, we usually hear that you can't really see the conjunction you can't really see so a camera that would be able you would be able to take a picture of it it would have to be some specialized uh camera to be able to see it to lower sort of the glare of the sun or i'm guessing probably yeah okay. and it would probably be very tricky because not only do you have to like if you lower the glare of the sun like uh you also have to increase the glare of the moon you know so it's like you're trying to lower the glare of uh one celestial body and, and increase maybe uh it even needs some post-production to you know uh to make that photo more prominent uh i would guess at least i don't know i'm uh, sure you have to be a wizard at photography to pull it off right? yeah yes. which i'm not <laughs> All specialized cameras for it. Um, they're known as CCD cameras, charge coupled uh, device cameras. So uh, they're they're like technologically superior to be able to detect things that regular cameras cannot detect. Cool. Awesome. And what about with like um, like binoculars or telescopes? Uh, do you think, uh, from your experience, have you heard of like anyone who? Uh, has been able to see the new, like at conjunction, let's say, you know, uh, with just binoculars or a telescope or something? Like optical uh, I think conjunction itself would be hard, but 
I I just looked something up and read that uh, a fellow in Iran, I'm Moshin Marsiad. I'm not certain about the pronunciation of the, but he caught the young moon with binocular with an aid. It says optical aid. I'm going to presume binoculars, but it could have been. To, 11 hours and 40 minutes after new moon. And that's the world record. Uh Okay. Well, so, and, uh, let's say, uh, if somebody, um, like from your experience, uh, what is the youngest you've ever, because you mentioned like, for example, I remember you, you writing somewhere also, like it's been like a sport for people to try to catch the, you know, the youngest crescent and whatnot. Have you personally, do you have a personal record? Yeah, just a little bit bit more than 22 hours really i mean getting it under 30 is hard but yeah so i think my best was 22 hours and i forgot i should have written it down (laughs) but uh so a couple times i've seen it that was less than 24 hours so let me ask you something. Like w- when you say that it was, you know, 22 hours old. So we're talking about basically con- from conjunction or the birth of the new moon. Right? Correct. Exactly. And, and that part is calculated, right? Like the birth of the new moon, because you only knew that it was 22 hours since the yep. birth of the new moon, not because you cited it, but because of the calculations that led Exactly. To right. Okay. Yeah. And that, actually, that's a good question. Um, Regarding calculations, uh, do you have any idea maybe from uh, your conversations, like how accurate are the um, calculations? Like, is there a margin of error? How do we know that margin of error? Uh, how accurate is it and, and whatnot? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that uh, timekeeping is extremely complex. And sometimes they'll give universal time for an event and also something that's called dynamical time, which is beyond my dynamical time is figuring the time uh, absent of the Earth's rotation. Universal time is based on the Earth's rotation, but there's uncertainty to some degree, about the Earth's rotation, where it will be. Uh, So you have that conflict. And if you uh, inquire with uh, almanacs that are very detailed, they'll give you what they think the dynamic, the uh, time difference between dynamic time and universal time. But this is extremely complicated stuff. After saying all that, I'm going to guess without knowing maybe a couple minutes off one way or another. Okay, so you're saying like he, with all the variables, like it could be like a couple minutes. But if somebody said, for example, maybe it's like 10 minutes off or 20 minutes off, that would, uh, do you think that would be like completely wrong? I think that's doubtful. I think it's, they're very, very close to, um, I'm, I'm going to guess a minute or two even they might be closer than that. Again, this isn't my area of yeah. expertise at all, even though I've looked at almanacs and tried to understand the difference between dynamical time and universal time. But I got to say, it, it's hard to understand. Sure. And so uh, another two about like doubting. So like, say, for example, um, at what age of the moon uh, would you... Uh, I guess, I, um, would you reject somebody's uh, testimony on, say, for example, they said, I saw it at 10 hours. Is that something that you would uh, highly doubt or you would reject sort of like that? You you would say that? Um, good question. I, I, I think if more people would really try to mm-hmm. do, I think young moon hunting would be a great sport. And if more people did it uh here's the i've read and astronomers say that they think the the elongation between the moon and sun has to be at least seven degrees 
Um, mm-hmm. And that would be roughly maybe a half hour after sunset to catch it. Uh, it'd be extremely hard. Uh, but, you know, it, it, there's so many factors like humidity in the air, dust in the air. Uh, I would be impressed. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh I think it'd be cool if somebody did that. Uh, but really, I mean, to get like the record right now is supposed to be 15 hours, 32 minutes mm-hmm. with the naked eye, even though I've, I just wrote this down, even though somebody claimed 13 hours and 34 minutes, but uh, how, I guess the trick is, is how do you make it official? Right. That's a good point. Uh, so, um, but let, let it looks you. like under fifteen hours would be really hard to do, but I think it'd be possible. Right. So, let me ask you something based on that. So, do you think like latitude uh, makes a difference in sightability? Like, because you mentioned certain factors, like uh, you know um, the uh, atmospheric conditions, right? Um, mm-hmm. in the air, so on and so forth. Uh, another factor that we can take in into consideration is also like light distortion, right, in the atmosphere. Yeah, um, sure. Um, do you think latitude will would also make a difference? Because uh, I'm wondering if like uh, at the poles or closer to the poles, right, like closer as we're in the in the northern hemisphere, and then there are people in the southern hemisphere. As we get closer to the poles. Does that make a difference in in terms of sightability versus people that are closer to the equator? Boy, that's a great question, and I'll try to make it simple. The advantage in the tropics would be is that twilight comes a lot faster in the uh, tropics than north or south of the tropics. So it seems like you would have a darker sky, and also the moon would tend to be directly above the sun, more so than north or south of the equator. But then after saying that, there's another factor to consider at far northern or far southern latitudes. Like, have you ever heard of a concept called like, um, oh, like standstill, like lunar standstill? No. I'll try to explain it real quickly without difficulty. Like when it's a minor lunar standstill year, the moon will only go from about 18 and a half degrees north to 18 and a half degrees south each month. That, But during a major standstill year, it would go from 28 and a half degrees north to 28 and a half degrees south every month. And that would benefit the northern and the southern latitudes because the new moon would even be out at, I mean, after sunset at far northern and southern latitudes. So I think in that regard, during a standstill year, which we're approaching, a major standstill year, which we're approaching now, that you could maybe even see a new moon uh, after sunset. I mean, this, I mean, a conjunction new moon. And that's, that's the answer, which, uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, give and take from latitudes. I think each latitude has its advantage and disadvantage. When you say uh, 28 degrees or 17 degrees north south, like, can you explain that a bit, like, uh, from a for a layman, like, how would uh, how would he understand that? Okay, um, you understand like the sun changes from 23 and a half degrees south, like at the solstice, at the our, what we can call our winter solstice. 
And then during the summer solstice, the sun is 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. Mm -hmm. That's understandable, right? Yeah. What is solstice? Maybe not. I just want to make it even more, uh, <laughs> even more simple. Uh, so, okay, so the moon can be five degrees more than that 23 and a half or less than that 23 and a half. Because we're not talking about the horizon, right? Like uh, usually when I hear degrees, like for example, the sun is at 15 degrees or minus 15 degrees, I think of above the horizon or below the horizon. So is that what we're talking about, the horizon, or are we talking about something else? Like okay, let, let me put it this way. Like when it's an equinox, the sun rises due east, sets due west, and we have about 12 hours of day and 12 hours a night. Sure, yeah. And okay, equinox, when you say when it's at equinox, uh, equal, equal, can you help me with the rest? Equal night. Equal right. night, okay. Okay, cool. So that means you would have exactly 12 hours of, uh, of day, 12 hours of night. And so uh, basically at zero degrees, the, the day would be, begin at, and at 180, the day would end. And at minus 180 to, or sorry, 180 to zero from the, in the negatives is when you would have your night. That would be, it. am I getting yeah. that right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it, the sun rises due east, sets due west, and you get 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night all over the world on that one day. Okay. But when the sun rises north of due east and sets north of due west, mm -hmm. you have a longer day and shorter night. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, and if it's a standstill, major standstill, the moon rises farthest north and sets and rises farthest north, sets farthest north. And it will be out for the greatest amount of time. So a lot of mm. times it will be out. Uh, bef the moon will be out even after the sun rises and the sun sets. I, I think, yeah, it's hard yeah. to explain. <clears throat> um, but a major standstill year would give the advantage to the far northern and far southern latitudes to see a young moon. Let's put it that way. That makes sense. So you get maximum. New moon, but earlier you also said um, a new moon, the conjunction. You said they would be actually able to see conjunction? I think so. Okay. If you're far north north or south. Hmm. Interesting. And would there ever be a, an advantage uh, for those on the equator to see a conjunction at any point in time? Um, and when you say conjunction, do you literally mean zero hours old? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, interesting. So then uh, I guess like um, when you mentioned like 10 hours would be really hard, the world record is 11 hours. If this is theoretically possible, then why why don't we have world records for like zero hours, one hour, one and a half hour or something like that? Um, well, because it would be too hard to see. Okay, like... Oh. Like mm -hmm. the uh, record with the optical aid I have written down here, 11 hours and 40 minutes after conjunction. I'll, I'll call it conjunction. Yeah, that would make it easier. Uh, I think it's, oh, and by the way, it was seven, I have written down here, it was seven and a half degrees elongation from the sun. And that's about what astronomers think would be the limit. It, yeah. it would probably just be too glary to see it. Okay, so even if, uh, you know, even if the moon has maximum exposure, uh, I guess what you were saying is that that would be the time when the moon has maximum exposure, but it still doesn't necessarily mean that you would be able to visually see it even with an optical aid, just simply because of the glare of the sun. Yeah, I think that's the tricky part, yeah. Okay, so you're talking about its presence in the sky uh, for the maximum amount of time, not really about visibility to the human eye. I guess that's correct, yes. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. What, uh, what are some, can you list out uh, some factors that would affect visibility? Uh, well, 
here's one thing right off the bat. Uh, a young moon near the spring equinox is much easier to see than at other times a year. On the other hand, a young moon that's near the autumn equinox is very hard to see. The reason being is like in spring, at sunset, the moon is almost straight above the sun. So it stays out for a maximum time after sunset. But in autumn, the moon is like at sunset, almost sideways of the sun. Be even though the elongation might be the same, it'll be sideways of the sun. It will set very soon after sunset near the autumn equinox. So your favorite, this is right now a good time to catch a young moon. Like mm. you should probably have no trouble catching it if you have an open sky on the ninth from it in Atlanta. Oh, uh, I'm yeah. Of course, it always helps to have binoculars because with binoculars you can see it earlier. But you'll even you can put your binoculars away and then still see it naked eye eventually. Uh, it's great sport. Um, are you in a position where you can see westward without many obstructions? We have too many trees. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have to go on the mountain. Oh, that doesn't help. No. Uh, we do have high points. Uh, um, North Georgia, uh, there's a lot of mountains, and we have, like, the Blue Ridge Mountains there. Or even Stone Mountain here. Oh, You've yeah. heard of Stone Mountain, uh, Mr. McClure? Yes, I have. Yeah. Awesome. I, and, I and like the Appalachian Trail part of Georgia. Yeah, the wow. northern part where, yeah. So that's a, that's an area that's kind of more elevated uh, than the rest. I had one question uh, about uh, equinox, right? You mentioned spring equinox, autumn equinox. Um, and you mentioned that the equinox is when there's equal night on like both sides of the earth, right? So that would mean... Um, does that mean like basically when uh, it's when the... Uh, like the sun, sun is at a point where, um, like, what is the, uh, why is it not equinox every single day, I guess? Uh, I think you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but why is it, uh, is it only two times a year? Is it three? Is it every season? Correct. Just two, twice a year. Oh, so only spring and autumn. Why not summer and winter? Uh, because, okay, here's how it works. Like at the equinoxes, neither pole, the North Pole or South Pole, points toward the sun or away from the sun mm. at all in the equinox. But on the summer solstice or our summer solstice, the North Pole points most to the sun and the South Pole points most away from it. So mm. our summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere would be the Southern Hemisphere's winter solstice. And uh, then during winter, the the North Pole would be pointing away from most pointing away from the sun. Mm. Uh, so does that have it in a nutshell for you? Sure. Yeah. That helps a lot. Okay. Yeah. One more question I actually wanted to ask you before when we were talking about calculations, like you mentioned uh, the calculations for the moon, uh, your guess would be that they would be maybe, you know, they could possibly be up to a minute or maybe two off. Um, would do you have any understanding of would that same thing apply to like uh, the s solar calculations maybe like for example when I ask Google hey what time is sunset because we usually break oh. our fast we usually break our fast at sunset right so for example if Google is saying that okay in Lilburn uh, the sun is going to set at you know let's just say uh, 8 uh, eight twenty three p.m. let's just say so um, uh, how uh, do you do you have any idea if, if there's any margin of error? Is it just a few seconds? Is it more accurate for the sun or less, or or how? Uh, let's put it this way: they usually don't give sunrise or sunset to the second. The reason being, oh, well, first of all, because Earth's atmosphere re -re refracts light. Have you ever put a straw like in a glass of water? and then yeah. see how it looks bent? Sure, of course. Well, the atmosphere does the same thing with the sun and moon uh, at wow. moonrise and moonset. Like 
when you see the sun sitting right above the horizon or right on the horizon, geometrically, it's still underneath the horizon. It's the Earth's atmosphere that lifts it up. And atmospheric refraction varies with like humidity, temp, uh, atmospheric pressure, and all kinds of things. So there, you can't predict sunrise or moonrise with absolute precision for that reason. Wow. So that's why they just round it off to the nearest minute rather than try to give it by seconds. And in your personal opinion, would you think that it would be better for people to, I guess, um, I'm, th I'm talking about from, uh, from our like religious point of view when we're trying to decide on when to break fast, when not to break fast. Just uh, kind of coming at it from the perspective of somebody who, you know, looks at and who, you know, uh, does timing according to sort of celestial bodies. Do you think that the the way of observation is the better way to go simply because it's um, it may not be as accurate in terms of uh, um, I mean, which one would you prefer? I guess I could say I, I would ask. Would you prefer the old method of telling time or the new method of telling time? And what's the value in the old method? Because um, it seems from what I'm hearing is that even the new method aren't exactly 100% accurate as we'd like them to be. There is always some sort of margin of error. Yeah, I would think so. And uh, I, I don't know that I prefer one over the other, but actually I like being outside and just watching uh, more than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just use sunrise and sunset as just something to go by. So yeah uh, and that would be about it okay interesting cool that makes sense you know, in terms of so basically the the context is that for for the islamic uh months right like the the lunar months uh the the month starts at the the uh, the, the sighting of the the crescent basically the earliest moon that is sightable after conjunction um so so now the the question would be that Basically, what uh, Asad was trying to uh, clarify is that um, uh, now that we basically have calculations, astronomical calculations or mathematical calculations that allow us to uh, predict whether the moon will be sightable or not, uh, would you rather rely on that to determine the start of the new month? Or would you actually just have people go out there and try to sight the moon? And if it's sighted, then the, the new month, which is basically the old method, and actually many people ad still adhere by that uh, today as well. They don't rely on the astronomic, uh, astronomical calculations. And from what I understand from your answer is that you prefer the, the sighting because it's just more accurate and it doesn't like, you know, uh, there are many other factors uh, like at atmospheric conditions uh, that are not taken into account in, in the calculations. Am I understanding that correctly? Sure. I'm, I I. And just the joy and fun of catching the crescent. I mean, uh, right. I there's nothing more exciting than catching a crescent in twilight. I think everybody should do it. I think. Yeah, I, I completely sympathize with you. I, I think there's something inherent uh, and something natural about us just connecting with the the things that we've coexisted with for you know uh, thousands, if not millions, of years. Um, but the other question that I wanted to ask you is. How about using those uh, astronomical calculations to deny the sightability? So basically, my question is: Let's say you do have people that go out there and they try to sight the the, the earliest new moon possible. Um, now, if somebody says, you know, after uh, ten hours or seven hours of the birth of the moon, if somebody says, "Hey, look, I've sighted the the, the moon," can we? Uh, based on astronomical calculations, can we reject that person's uh, sightability? Huh. Um, that wouldn't be based on astronomical calculations, right? Because it, it would be based on uh, visibility maps and stuff like that rather than... Yeah, but that's astronomical calculations as well because part of visibility map maps is the angle of the moon and, uh, okay. and all that, right? 
So okay, sure. I think there's too much to consider or because how do you predict all these factors like humidity, dust in the air, clarity of the air? I mean, uh, so I think there's always going to, I mean, you can maybe give a ballpark estimate, like if it's visible or possible. But I don't know that you can come up with an absolute. Um, I think that's what makes it fun, too, and enjoyable is because it can't be. I do have a question for you, though. Sure. Like now that there's going to be a solar eclipse on the 8th, could you call, okay, even though you won't see the crescent after sunset on that day, you'll still know that conjunction happened. I, I had a feeling you would ask that question, actually. Okay, I want to hear your answer. All right. Yeah. I mean, what it is is that uh, uh, we have a legal precedent, like in, in Islamic law, we have a legal precedent for um, uh, solar and, and lunar eclipses. So those are never counted as uh, the, the sighting of the new moon for the for the new month. Okay. Right. But that's a really great question, though. Right. Uh, well. Yeah, the beginning and the ending of them is just like fully about did, uh, did sighting happen or not. And usually the difficulty comes up is when we have sort of these sightability maps uh, online and uh, when you have these sightability maps, it'll say like, it's impossible to see it here, or it'll be impossible for people in this region to see it. The question is now, should those people go out and still try to see it? Or should they just kind of like, whatever? Oh, why not try? I mean, especially if it's clear, right? Yeah. Why not try? Yeah. Um, I don't think binoculars or optical aid would count, right? But you could still do that as well. Yeah. So try. with the optical, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's room for optical aid according to some positions. Like, but it has to be visible to the naked eye, right? Yeah. So because it's still you're still looking at it with your naked eye, even though it's magnified through some glass. Mm -hmm. So that would still count as a naked eye according to those. Okay. Those who hold that. Position. Yeah. I mean, there's a legal difference of opinion based on this. There, there are some uh, legal experts that would say that. Uh, you can only sight it from with the naked eye. That's the only kind of sighting that counts. But there are others that say that if it is sighted uh, with an opt optical aid, that would still, they wouldn't consider like CCD cameras because that's a little artificial. Um, mm -hmm. But they would consider something like binoculars and telescopes. Okay. Or and like then, glasses. <laughs> and of course, with uh, binoculars, I use them, and then you can spot it, and then. Like I said, you can put your binoculars down, and then eventually you'll still see it with the naked eye. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How much of an advantage does that give you? Does it does it knock off like hours or? Okay, what's the question? Like, so for example, using an optical aid. Uh, I oh, know you. I, yeah. It depends. I'd say it like five minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean it. It's not a lot of difference. I mean, okay. time-wise, but it's like the binoculars just give you a little bit of an edge. Hmm. But no, I wouldn't say that it's a great deal. Or sometimes I'd use binoculars, catch it, mm -hmm. and then almost immediately see the, mm -hmm. the crescent. Because then you know right where it is. That's, you know, just learning how to look takes a, a while. Mm -hmm. A lot of times... I didn't even know I was looking at it. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it takes because it's so very, very, very thin. Uh, it's so easy to overlook, and it's just a matter of I think training your eye. You know, I was giving an anecdotal uh, example to uh, Musab one time that when you know I was overseas and um, I actually had some of my cousins. They were telling me, "Look, it's right there. They're pointing at it," and I'm like, "I don't see anything." And they're like, look harder, look harder. And I guess after like a few minutes, then I could see like this very thin line. I mean, it was like almost like a hair. And yeah. I was like, how on earth did you guys see that? You know, like five minutes ago, like it's impossible. Like I was looking exactly where they were telling me and I couldn't see it. They were yeah. probably really practiced at it. Yeah. yeah. I'm guessing. Uh, yeah. So I had uh, like, mm -hmm. I wanted to make a draw a distinction between impossibility and high improbability, right? 
So, for example, if somebody claims to see the moon, uh, the crescent at 1 a.m., we know that's impossible, right? Okay, right. Uh, nobody would uh, accept that. And, and that's simply because, um, uh, what's it called? When uh, the whole point of, uh, of a new moon is that it's between you and the sun. So only uh, you're only going to catch it in your daytime or close to sunset or sunrise, right? If I'm not wrong, like at those ends. Um, I mean, like on on conjunction, if we were able to see the uh, see the new moon, like um, on conjunction, the moonrise is at sunset. Uh, sorry, the moonrise and sunset. Uh, the moonrise, sun, sunrise are the exact same, and moonset, sunset are the exact same, right? You mean with the moon and the sun yeah. at new moon? Yes, at new uh, at new moon, um, moonrise and sunrise, sunset and moonset are the same timing. Is that right? It'd only be if it was in conjunction meaning eclipse okay so there, there's going to be a slight difference but it will be close it'll be close yeah yes. yeah so uh what uh that means that um you know uh, on conjunction like and as as the moon you know grows and it waxes um you know uh, it'll go into the night a little bit um but um but still overwhelmingly it's going to match with um sunrise sunset right so that that means that it's going to be there present in the daytime uh for the most part so if somebody claims to see it at 1 a.m at night he's on the other side of the uh, of the globe of the ball so it's it's impossible and we could reject somebody's sighting who says i saw it at 1 a.m because oh, sure. you're, you're, you're on the wrong side you know you're on the wrong side now when it comes to like imp so impossibility like from from that point of view it's it's easy um now for improbability i'm just giving another uh, an example like let's say there is a world record for swimming 100 yards right and that world record and we have like a history of like you know 50 or 100 years and that world record is uh whatever i'm just making something up right like uh, 35 seconds right and we know for 100 years nobody has broken this or something like that and now somebody says i did it in 15 seconds now we cannot say it's impossible maybe uh, but it is so improbable that we could reject and say that sure. this guy's lying, right? So oh, sure. now when it comes to uh, the moon, right? That's kind of what, like, uh, I guess we, we wanted to get at earlier. Like if somebody's saying that, okay, um, uh, if the world record really is, you know, and you actually talked about like, what makes things official? Is there an official body and and whatnot? And people have been doing this for thousands of years, literally. So uh, I wish we had some data that we could draw from. But uh, let's say if somebody says, okay, I saw the moon at, at three hours, right? So is that improbable enough that we could just say, hey, get lost. You don't know what you're talking about, you know, <laughs> like something like that. And uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll let you speak to that. Well, I, I don't know how you'd come up with the proof on that one. Uh, right. Uh, but let's say let's say that, OK, even we don't accept we don't need like a proof. Right. Because uh, for us, like if somebody sees the moon at a reasonable time, we're not going to tell him give, give us a proof as long as he's um, he's an honest person. And, you know, his witness is intact. Um, his testimony is intact. Sorry. Then we would uh, we would accept what he says. Right. Um, but. Uh, so it'd be like, okay, you're telling the truth until proven uh, otherwise. Uh, Mufti, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, right? Well, here's another factor to consider. Like, I know that I thought I caught, okay, remember, it's going to be barely, as Assad said, you can barely, barely see it. Like, he didn't, you didn't see it for five minutes after the other fellows. Oh yeah, I mean, it was it was a long time ago, but it was quite some time afterwards where I actually started to see the. It was almost like a hairline, you know. But and they were looking and, at it from before me, and I was just kind of surprised that they could even spot it when it was. But now and again, you'll even have a cloud that will look like that, mm. you know, and it will throw you off. Uh, <laughs> because remember again, when you look at it, it's so 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 faint. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, I was tricked by that and I go, Oh no, it was just a cloud. But, uh, so I think somebody even honest could be mistaken mm -hmm. because yeah, it's going to set almost immediately after you see it anyway. Uh, cause you're just hoping to catch it before it sets. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Sure. Yeah. And actually, that's another good point, right? Like when we say somebody, uh, somebody could just be uneducated, right, about the moon. And then he looks up at a time where uh, and he thinks he saw the moon, but he saw something else, maybe. Um, so so we wouldn't say, OK, you're lying. Right. But we could just say, OK, if you saw the moon at three hours after conjunction um, and and if conjunction, the margin of error is only like, you know, two minutes or something, we can safely conclude uh, with a high degree, a very, very high degree of probability that you didn't see the moon. Right. Um, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's pretty much, uh, I guess, what we were coming at. So I guess uh, before we kind of conclude the conversation, I want to ask you, what is the best way to cite the moon? You know, what? what's great is to find a balcony or a mountain or a hill. You, The more elevated you are, the better, because you can see a little further past the horizon. Mm -hmm. And with the young moon, that counts for everything. Of course, mm -hmm. it, you want no trees like you were talking about, no houses. You want it as clear a horizon as you could possibly find. Mm -hmm. uh, there you go. I mean. Uh, no light pollution. Would you, that would also affect it, right? Um, Tell the whole city to turn off their lights. Yeah. I well, don't know, mountain, but... Because it's twilight anyway. Mm. Um. I, I don't know that that would be a big, f you certainly don't want lights in the direction that you're looking though, mm -hmm. because you could mistake that possibly yeah. for the moon. Yeah, so, yeah in that yeah. regard, it'd be nice not to have any lights, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at least in the west direction that you're looking. If it's behind you, I don't think it would matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had I had a, a couple more questions uh, regarding visibility maps. Um, can you tell us about visibility maps and what they take into account? Um, do they establish impossibility, improbability? Um, do you know about much about visibility maps? No, I don't even use them. Oh wow! Well, so I know very little about them, mm. except I know that they're around. No, I I just go out if it's. Of course, I live in northern New York. Clear skies are to be taken for granted. So if it's clear and I know it's around young moon or new moon, I guess you would call it new moon, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I just look. So. Uh, Interesting. Awesome. Uh, among, if, um, I guess, uh, for the for the viewers, if somebody wants to learn more about um moon sighting or even stargazing or just learning more about the sky in general um and they don't let's say they don't want to pursue a degree in astronomy right what is the best like what are the best resources community resources uh maybe books articles or uh whatever else that you would recommend for them to get up to speed on this and educate themselves of course there's earthsky.org <laughs> right i have to mention that uh of course um do you have a planet? You know, planetariums are great uh, resource. You must have one in Atlanta somewhere. Uh, Not sure. I don't uh, remember hearing about one in Atlanta. I remember in I studied in South Africa, and there was a planetarium at the Wits University. I don't know uh, if uh, Tufel, Mufti Tufel, did you, did you guys go there or? I, I haven't, but I'm pretty sure almost any major university will have like an observatory. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking so I'm, I'm sure in Atlanta and Georgia, there has to be one yeah. of the top universities. I just did a quick search and uh, there's like uh, in Decatur, Bradley Observatory and Delafield Planetarium. Mm -hmm. And there's Jim Cherry Memorial Planetarium. This is in Atlanta. And there are, it seems that there are a few. Yeah, there has to be. In each state, there has to be. Yeah, yeah. And also, there are star parties. And if you do a search, the, some star parties even last for a week, but more, more often a few days. And it's great, especially if you don't know much about a telescope, because at star parties, people with their telescopes want to show them off so bad. So they do, they set them up, they operate them. And it's a great place to learn about astronomy. Mm. So I, that's wow. another thing you can do. 
Yeah, we want to get more Muslims involved in this, and especially because in Islamic scripture, it all, it, it actually emphasizes to go out and look into the heavens and to study the heavens, you know? Uh, I can relate. I understand that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I think it's important for a lot of, uh, just from that angle, at least we have a religious angle to it as well. Yeah, and I think we like just, our viewers to take it up. I think also as time goes, like people are just becoming so technologically dependent that uh, they're, they're, they're failing to account for the kind of uh, shortfalls that might exist in in the technology we almost take them for granted but i think there's something to be said about you know just the accuracy of uh, human action itself yeah uh, i understand that the u.s navy has recently um, they're giving celestial navigation now uh something because the gps has fallen to the wayside but they realize like well, you know what? You can always jam GPS, but you can't jam the stars and the sun and the moon. So it's taking on a new life again. Uh, of course, I just find it a thrill to be more connected to nature, heaven. So uh, yeah, no. it's a that, you know we don't have any real connection to uh, the heavens and to those things that are around us. We become dis detracted, disconnected. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's like um, a new level of individualism, you know, it's like very withdrawn. <laughs> like, yeah, and, I, I mm. think the moon was just a common reference, mm. especially for, you know, the month. I yeah. mean, yeah. Uh, and we've almost forgotten that that's a reference for the month. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, I think even, even, even for the solar calendar, uh, in reality, the months are they're supposed. I think initially they were based on the moon, but then like days were added so that you know it, it matches with the uh, uh, with the solar uh, cycle as well. Uh, but but the idea of a month is from the moon, right? Definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Even though like twelve lunar cycles is what about three hundred and fifty four days, something like that, or. So yeah. it's shy of the 365 day year. Mm -hmm. So a solar month is just a few days longer than a lunar month, but it's still, that's where it's derived from. Sure. Cool. Um, there's something yeah. that's important to be said about the ability. I remember somebody was giving a talk and they were talking about how, you know, we think we're advancing, but in reality, all we're doing is we're losing abilities to do different things. So they, they were giving more um, physiological examples, like people in the past, they had the ability to like squat for a long time, you know, and in modern, you know, in the modern area, we use chairs and things like that. And because of that, we're not able to actually sit in certain positions. And he was saying that that's actually not advancement. That's actually um, sort, of, sort of like you're retrograding, you're, you're actually losing abilities. You're not adding advancement, huh? Yeah. Definitely. I think Joni Mitchell put it well, the songwriter. She said, mm -hmm. something's lost and something's gained in living every day. Mm. And mm. I think, yeah, she nailed it. I mm. think that's right. It's a give, give and take, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I know you, uh, you have a degree or a, a, a certificate in celestial navigation. How good are you? Like if, if, if we just took everything away from you, uh, and just told you to go from like uh, New York to uh, let's say Oregon. Would, do you think you'd be able to do it easily? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, awesome. I think it would be trickier crossing the ocean, though. <laughs> yeah, or the maritime Being on land is easier. Uh, but yeah, I do. I mean, Why is it harder in the ocean? Is it because you don't have any control over the water? Is that? Um, well, I think, again, longitude is a tricky thing in the ocean to figure out. Mm. Uh, though you can, I would need, when I got my certification in 98, I haven't really used it. I did it more just to, because I was interested. Yeah. I would need some practice again. Yeah. I would need to get refreshed. But, but one thing you can do for sure, even like in old times, latitude is real easy for the most part. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're in Europe and you want to go west. 
that's pretty easy to do. The hard thing would to figure out is what's your longitude? Like how far are you from Europe and how close are you to North America? Mm. Yeah. Uh, but Columbus got both of them wrong. looks like. Yeah, <laughs> right. He just went West. Right. And he, what was he going for? China? <laughs> or the, yeah. uh, how do you, how, where, where do you, where can you get a celestial navigation certificate? Somebody might be interested and they might want to take it up. Well, I got mine in Portland, Maine. It's called Ocean School of Navigation. So mm -hmm. I, guess, I presume they still do it. Like like I said, I got it in 98, so it's been a while. Mm. Um, Interesting. So maybe if do a search, put in Maine and Celestial Navigation, maybe it will come up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm presuming they still teach it. I'm not sure because I was, it was only two of us who were taking it. Uh, when we took it, we went in the sailboat and everybody else was doing coastal navigation. So it was almost like celestial navigation was losing its legs because there wasn't much interest. And I was just lucky that they even offered it. So I, I don't know if they still have it or not. Mm. Yeah, we want to encourage our viewers, especially uh, because of the religious imperative as well, to kind of revive this sort of dying uh, art or skill. Well, it's been I think an hour and six minutes, and uh, I know we don't want to hold you up for too long. So if there's anything that you would like to tell the viewers about going out and looking uh, into the cosmos, um, you know, you can have a word and then inshallah we'll sort of close up the, uh, close the program on some final words. Oh, what, what can I say? It looks like Ramadan's coming in with a bang and leaving with a bang because this last new moon that started Ramadan was the closest new moon of the whole year. Hmm. Uh, and, wow. and then, of course, it's going to not quite end with the eclipse, but yeah. it's sort of the eclipse is a great marker that, okay, tomorrow's probably the day you're going to see the crescent <laughs> if you look hard enough. Yeah. And the next month, lunar month is going to be the shortest one of the year. It's going to be like 29 days and nine hours, I think. Mm -hmm. Like usually the, the, on the average, it'd be 29 days and 12 hours and 44 minutes. So. And what is the longest and shortest uh, usually? I think you looked. I think you looked it up once. You mentioned it to me. Well, generally, the longest will be about thirteen hours longer than the shortest. Hmm. So it varies. Um, just oh, we were talking about perigee and apogee. I don't know if you know the terms or what they mean, but perigee means the moon at its closest point in its orbit an apogee at its farthest point. Like the moon's distance from Earth varies by about 30,000 miles or 50 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So a new moon that aligns closely with perigee will give rise to a short lunar month. And a new moon that pairs up closely with apogee will give rise to a long solar month. Just a little something to uh, depart on. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. It was a really fascinating and, you know, uh, interesting discussion. And we were happy to have you on. And hopefully we can um, probably meet you when we go to New York and go out and look into the the sky and <laughs> well, I think sounds good. Do a moon, do a moon search. Uh, you know, together one day. Yeah, I think like uh, training for like actual sighting of the moon. That would be something pretty cool that maybe yes. you, can, you can offer. Like, yeah. would that be something you'd be interested in? To like sort of take people out and train them into how to look for the moon. Oh, like yeah, if we had practical fun. classes. Sure, I'd think about it. You no. bet. <laughs> so maybe we can work on something like that but really thank you for your time and we were oh you're welcome 
We're uh, pleased to have you and you're welcome on our podcast uh, whenever you'd like to come on or there's something interesting you'd like to share with our community. Uh, we'd be more than happy to have you on again. And, that sounds uh, good. Don't forget to look at the eclipse on Monday. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a big... Yeah, Hopefully you'll big. have clear skies. Hopefully we'll all have clear skies. So. Well, the thing about the eclipse is it stays well, in the sky for quite a few hours. Oh, yeah, yeah. In, in New York, it's more in Buffalo that it would be Buffalo is right in the thick of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm still about 300 miles from Buffalo. We're really, we're in a place that nobody knows about. Anything north of the Adirondacks Mountains in New York, nobody knows about. We're, sort of, <laughs> we're in the bo boonies, I guess you could say. Okay. I mean, I, I use the 87 like many times. I've done it on my motorcycle. Um, so so like I'm, I'm aware of like, uh, for example, Lake George and even above that, like uh, actually, as a matter of fact, where I'm from in Canada, it's right across the border. Um, uh, Messina is right across. Oh, the I'm only 20 miles from Messina. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I've used that airport also there many times. Uh, we shop there because it's cheaper milk. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, Cape Air? Is that yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And I use that highway a lot, like uh, 87. I'm there all the time. So, yeah. Saratoga. Right by, by, yeah, okay. So you guys are neighbors then. Well, Musab, <laughs> if you have anything you want to add before we close off the recording. No, that's it from my side. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McClure, for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. And, uh, I hope the viewers and uh, everyone benefited. Uh, please uh, give the video a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel. And <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. We'll see you guys next time. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.